and welcome to uh, English 405 505 uh, Theories and Principles of Professional Communication. I'm your professor, Dr. Matt Barton, and all throughout the semester we'll be doing these, I'll be going uh, through these PowerPoints with you. I'm trying to touch on the key points of the chapters and as much as possible trying to relate everything back to one of my favorite television shows, uh, The Office, uh, because I think we can learn a lot from uh, those episodes. Uh, sometimes taking a step back, taking a more lighthearted, uh, humorous approach, uh, looking at that satire, uh, can actually be really enlightening. I think we'll uh, uh, have some fun with that. Uh, but anyway, this first chapter is called Establishing Credibility. Obviously a very important topic in professional communication or business communication or <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Uh, so uh, for now, before we start, I want you to think about that episode of The Office and, and think about what does Michael Scott do to try uh, to establish credibility with that audience. What works? What doesn't work? Uh, why is it <laughs> so hilarious? Uh, what can we learn from that or glean about credibility from that uh, uh, from that clip? Uh, so I'll stop for a moment, let you answer that question, and then we'll jump into this chapter. All right, so we have four learning objectives for this, this lesson. Uh, we'll be talking about how to uh, or why it's important to establish credibility. Why is this such a big deal? Uh, we'll talk about competence, caring, and character, and how those can affect credibility. Uh, we'll define business ethics, uh, corporate values, personal values, uh, how, all, all, how all these are interrelated. And then we'll uh, wrap up with the discussion of the, the FAIR approach, uh, an acronym that this author has come up with, and it's actually very helpful. And this is the overview of the chapter, and it's pretty much identical to those learning uh, outcomes. Uh, from the previous slide, slide except here we spell out <laughs> fair approach so you know what it means uh, facts access impacts and respect uh, so first off credibility what is it and they define it here as your reputation for being trustworthy and also the degree to which others believe or trust in you so i think now about my own credibility uh, putting this powerpoint together uh, there's certain things working in my favor that may, might make me uh, seem more credible. Uh, the fact I have a, a PhD in the subject matter, that I'm a professor here for so many years, uh, that uh, if you ask around, you know, you'll probably hear, oh, he's a pretty good professor, knows what he's talking about. Uh, so that's part of my reputation for being trustworthy. Uh, on the other hand, what if I uh, was you know, really harsh on grading papers or kind of had a reputation for uh, having favorites, uh, favorite students and uh, being dismissive of, of whole groups of students. That sort of thing would tarnish my credibility uh, in a major way with you. And we can think about this concept with any uh, communication situation, right? What have you done? Uh, it's not just your reputation, but what can you do in the future, maybe? Uh, what can you do to make others more likely uh, to believe or trust in you? So one of the more interesting things I got from this chapter was the idea of uh, living in the post-trust era. So I'm not sure we've ever really lived in an era where everybody just trusted everything they heard from the, uh, the officials, uh, the administrators, the business leaders, uh, the politicians, or, or what have you. Uh, but it definitely seems that we have shifted even more towards uh, being skeptical uh, being dubious, uh, always uh, assuming that we're being lied to or manipulated. And you could blame a lot of uh, things for that, but it's, it is sort of basically the reality. He says it's one of the first things you should consider as you communicate. How do you establish or how do you uh, get people to trust you? Uh, so this should always be your goal. Gain trust, credibility, and it's not just from the people that your your customers and clients, but also colleagues, other contacts, you really have to be careful uh, because this can extend uh, from your business, from your agency, uh, even into personal life. I mean, I'm thinking of uh, all of those examples recently uh, where uh, CEOs get on Twitter, let's say, and they post something inappropriate. And even though that's a personal account, you know, it doesn't really have anything to do with their leadership role in the company, it nevertheless damages that. Uh, and it probably does come back to have an impact. And they could even get fired uh, over something like this. So it's a constant concern. Now, so here's some other claims. Uh, the public increasingly views companies with less trust. Uh, I mean, there's just <laughs> legions of examples 
Oh, the one I keep coming back to because I uh, was a Volkswagen owner uh, when I moved uh, here to Minnesota. I got <laughs> got this big Ike Volkswagen uh, dealership, and I was pretty happy with my uh, Passat and my uh, we got a Jetta. Uh, but then this stuff started to come out about how Volkswagen had cheated on some uh, some uh, government uh, testing, some emission standards, and uh, I don't remember all the the key uh, details of that, but it kind of emerged that Volkswagen had been fudging that, uh, basically lying to people, making their cars seem a lot more ecologically uh, uh, safe than they turned out to be, at least within those uh, parameters. Uh, now, apparently there's some, you know, there's been some back and forth with this, and uh, maybe the media was a little unfair to uh, Volkswagen, you know, I don't know. Uh, but the point is, it really did make me a lot more skeptical uh, of Volkswagen after that, and it would, I mean, it did considerable harm. Uh, so I'm sure you can think of lots of examples of other companies where something like that has happened. And add it all up, and it just makes us uh, increasingly skeptical of all companies. He also says there's a deficit, deficit of trust within the companies. Uh, so people aren't just so, uh, you know, they know they could be uh, laid off at any time, right? Uh, or the uh, the company could just shut uh, shut down the operation, move it to another uh, country. Uh, there's all sorts of reasons to be skeptical. And a lot of people, you know, we talk about back in the day when you might work for the same company or institution your whole life and retire. Uh, that seems uh, more and more and more unlikely. You know, people are, uh, will shift a couple of times uh, to different companies. Now, so these are all uh, problems. And we're going to take a look here at a survey. <laughs> yeah, surveys show that employees often do not trust their own business leaders. Uh, so even here in the university, you might uh, overhear some professors talking. You know, they don't really have a lot of faith in their uh, the, the leadership. You know, things happen that they don't like. Uh, it's not clear that they the administration has your best interests at heart. You know, the same thing with students, too. You might think about how students may not trust uh, their professors fully. They might think the professor might be uh, biased somehow uh, against them. And likewise, uh, the even the professors might be uh, skeptical of their students, right? And they think the students might uh, be lying about something, uh, misrepresenting something, <laughs> cheating, plagiarizing, uh, you name it. All right, so this is kind of fun. Uh, so it looks, I look at trust in various professions. And so I think it's kind of fun that a nurse is <laughs> the top. And so apparently a lot of people trust their nurse when they're in the hospital. I guess that's a good thing. Uh, hope, hopefully it's not Nurse Ratchet. <laughs> uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Uh, look at pharmacists also uh, doing pretty well there. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, grade school teachers, medical doctors, military office, <laughs> officers. Uh, you know, so none of this is really all that shocking. Um, when you get on down here, like auto mechanics, you know, you think a lot of them might be. Uh, a little shady, perhaps, uh, <laughs> bankers. <laughs> I look at the members of Congress, though. My goodness, uh, only 8% for them. So apparently we are really dubious about our members of Congress. And poor old uh, car salespeople, they always get a bad reputation. Uh, anyway, it's a fun chart. Uh, the post-trust era. So what is this? The public overwhelmingly views businesses as operating against the public's best interests. And the majority of employees view their leaders and colleagues with skepticism. So you're probably sensing a, a bit of a theme here. Uh, so I think it's a, he makes a pretty good case uh, throughout the book uh, or throughout this chapter that, yeah, this is true. You know, people aren't just going to assume I'm here, I'm here from the government and <laughs> I'm here to help. <laughs> They're probably going to be scared, more scared of that uh, than relieved that you're there. Uh, so this is just an environment that we have to deal with. And so here we have a depiction of a stool, three-legged stool, and it's trying to get across the idea of the uh, components of credibility. And so we've got competence, caring, and character as uh, three different legs of this stool. And the reason it's a stool is that just like a real life, a real stool, if we remove one of the legs, it would suddenly become... Uh, unsafe <laughs> to sit upon and, and likewise if you you might be really have a great deal of competence you might be really good at your job uh, but if the client or whoever it is you're 
uh, interacting with, communicating with, doesn't think you care about them, or that you are uh, your character's bad, maybe you're dishonest somehow, uh, that's not really going to matter. This the stool will fall. And so you really have to work on all three of these components. And now first up is the competence. And the example in the uh, the book is, is helpful here. Uh, they, the case studies that we'll do a little later. Uh, they talk about the three different candidates and how they uh, vary in these uh, each one of these components. But uh, competence is basically just uh, can you get the job done? Uh, do you have the right knowledge? Do you have the skills? Can you convince somebody uh, that you're the right person uh, for this work? And they say this is based mostly on a track record of uh, success and achievement. So uh, again, on, on a resume, uh, one of the key things is your experience, right? They want to see, well, what jobs have you had previously? And always stress in 332, not don't just list what you had to do, but what can you show on that resume, is there anything that might point towards being successful, uh, some, some type of achievement? Uh, that's going to uh, really help establish your competence. Uh, how do you develop competence? Well, <laughs> you're probably most familiar with this one, studying. Uh, so people go to school to learn a new skill. Uh, but you can also learn many other ways, and a lot of these other ways are usually more effective sometimes. Uh, just observing somebody who's really good at the job. Uh, you can sometimes shadow people at the workplace, learn how they do it, uh, see what they're doing, uh, practicing the skill, obviously, and as well as uh, real life experiences. So we, we will learn a lot on the job. Uh, no matter how much you study, uh, there still will be uh, things to learn once you get there. And how you communicate directly affects how others perceive your competence. Uh, so you know this. That's one of the reasons why English classes are so important, and grammar, mechanics, all that <laughs> business, <laughs> uh, even uh, proper speaking. Uh, you might be really good at the job, right? But uh, if you have all kinds of errors, if, if you seem uh, scatterbrained, uh, if you're not really able to articulate things well, uh, they might actually start to question your competence, even though you might actually be really good at your job, uh, but the communication can impact that perception. Now, so here's a little bit more about how to establish credibility. And uh, the first is focusing on action. You know, in other words, what can you do? What can you physically do today uh, that will have some impact on how people uh, view your credibility? Uh, maybe this is uh, doing an extra project. You know, just thinking about as a professor, uh, there's all sorts of things I can do. Uh, I can work on a research article, uh, attend a, a workshop. Um, you know, join, be part of a, be active on the committees that I've been uh, appointed to. Uh, so just doing things is, uh, even if I make some mistakes, you know, maybe I get a little too <laughs> ambitious and it doesn't quite work out. Uh, they, the argument here is that just people will be more impressed that you tried, or that I tried to do something, uh, than they would be if I just sat around and didn't even uh, do anything. And so being active and engaged is the first key. Uh, the second part is emphasizing results. So what can I do to show or to prove uh, that I'm competent? Um, and this is a big deal here at St. Cloud State. We've been having all these sort of endless discussions about uh, student success initiatives and, and assessments, uh, student learning outcomes. And <laughs> it can be kind of boring, but you know, really it's, it's a good question, right? How can I prove, how can I show that you're actually learning things uh, in my class, how can I prove that the class is, you know, I'm successfully reaching those those uh, student learning outcomes? So it could be looking at uh, test scores, uh, but it could also be just talking to students, you know, talking to you, uh, getting you to reflect on things, and then uh, basically coming up with some body of evidence that I can point to. I uh, say so when the deans come around and want to know, <laughs> you know, how, how have you been? Um, I can have something to point at and say, look, I. I tried this new technique. It, uh, you know, the participation went up. I got uh, much fewer errors on my, on the essays this time. <laughs> you know, whatever it is, uh, the key is I can point to it and say, look, this, this shows that what I've been doing actually worked. All right, moving on to, uh, to caring, then, and 
this is kind of a nice concept. It's <laughs> you think about the oh, you care, you actually care. We care about you. You know, it often gets said. Companies say this all the time, right? You know, uh, this pharmaceutical company really cares about your well-being. Hmm. Uh, but nevertheless, it is key, right? And they got a nice quote here from Mahatma Gandhi that I would read here. Uh, the moment there is suspicion about a person's motives, everything he does becomes tainted. So the moment there is a suspicion about a person's motives, everything he does becomes tainted. Uh, so that seems to be true. I would uh, agree with this quote. It's, it's hard to recover <laughs> sometimes if you have done something that people, uh, if they feel like you put your own interest ahead of somebody else, if you have uh, violated trust, uh, if you don't seem to care about your clients, your customers, <laughs> your students, your trainees, whatever, uh, this will have a big impact. And uh, so this is all to say this is not like some, uh, you know, fluffy concept. It's actually crucial. So what do we mean when we say caring? Well, what we're implying is that we understand the interests of others. You're cultivating a sense of a community. And so you're not just in it for the, the money, right? But you are part of that community. Uh, you're giving to others and showing generosity. So you might say this uh, colleague really cares about her, uh, her uh, colleagues, right? Or this uh, professor really cares about her students. And we would probably look and see, well, do they, <laughs> does she really know what these students need? Yes. Uh, is she engaged beyond the classroom? You know, maybe they're having, a, maybe she's talking to students out in the hall, right? Or having discussions with them outside of class, creating that a sense of community. Uh, giving a little extra time uh, to students that need that and not being so uh, harsh and severe. You know, sometimes it's better to be a little generous and just uh, not uh, feel like the, the book has to come before the student, right? So people distrust individuals who are perceived as unconcerned about their interests uh, of others or disinterested in causes above and beyond themselves. In other words, uh, selfish, self-centered people. Uh, there's plenty of them. <laughs> you might be one yourself. <laughs> uh, so you want to start thinking about it. Well, do people tend to say you're self-centered or that you're selfish? Uh, if they say that about you, then you might reasonably ask, why is that? Or why do I have that perception? Uh, what can I do? Maybe I need to take some action to show that's not the case. Or maybe change <laughs> your face. <laughs> right? But uh, you want people to think, you know, especially, you know, I'll give you an example here. I recently bought a, a vehicle. And I went to a couple of different dealerships, right? And the, and the first dealership uh, I went to was the, the Toyota Toyota place. And, uh, you know, the, the salesperson there didn't even come out of the of the little office area, right? And finally, I was <laughs> like, are you going to, do you care at all that I'm even here on the lot looking for a car? And, uh, you know, his, his attitude was, well, these cars basically sell themselves. You know, you, you come to me if you have any questions. You know, it just kind of kind of rubbed off on me is the guy just really didn't care uh, about me. Uh, just seemed kind of disinterested, right? Uh, I go to the Dodge place, uh, McKay's, totally different story. You know, the, I can I can actually remember the name of the, the salesperson there, Matt. Uh, really nice. Uh, seemed like, you know, he was asking me questions like, what kind of car do I want? He really seemed to be listening to me. Uh, and he really seemed to, to care like he wasn't in a rush, nothing like that. Um, just really did a much better job of uh, showing caring. And I didn't know him, never met him before, went to the lot. Uh, but just in the course of those hours, really convinced me anyway that he actually cared. You know, and then later on they did things, you know, send us some cards, uh, you know, keeping in touch, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so it really seemed like a, a caring, even though it was a professional you know, you don't, it's just buying a car, right? <laughs> uh, but that cultivated that sense of a community. And you start to feel like, uh, well, there's something about Dodge, right? Dodge owners versus, uh, you know, uh, Toyota owners, I guess. You know, you do kind of have a sense of community. Uh, you really find it too with the. So understanding the interests of others. How do we understand what other people uh, are interested in? Uh, so they say here it's, 
your ability to gain the credibility strongly depends on this on this ability to show that you actually care for the needs of others. And so you gain trust by connecting with others, seeking to understand their ideas, wants, opinions, feelings, and aspirations. And so again, I want to pause here and come back to that clip of the office we watched and think about this question. Does uh, Michael, how does he, does he try to gain the trust? Does he seem to be connecting uh, with their ideas? Does he seem like he understands their needs or does he seem like he doesn't understand <laughs> their needs, wants, opinions? Uh, does he have a pretty good handle on their feelings and, and what they want and expect or does he seem like he's got the wrong ideas? So take a minute to meditate on that. Uh, here we go with cultivating a sense of community, and I think this is a really good, a really good slide and a really good part of this chapter. Uh, they they talk to us as professors all the time about students. How do we attract students to the university, and then once we get them here, how do you retain them? You know, we want you to uh, go all the way through the program and, and graduate. We don't want people to uh, feel disconnected and drop out. And they they keep coming back to this idea that what the really the key difference is when they've done survey after survey study after study and the students that tend to stick around and graduate uh, the main factor is whether they feel like they belong you know do they feel like do they sort of identify as a as a husky right uh, do you feel a connection to the school do you feel like you fit in well uh, with your classmates and uh, if you do uh, then you'll probably uh, graduate on time uh, but if, on the other hand, you feel like nobody really cares about you, uh, you feel kind of alienated for some reason, uh, you feel like people are uh, snobs or snubbing you for whatever reason, uh, just anything that makes you feel like you don't belong is, uh, is going to be a, a really harmful. You know, so we're really are taking this uh, stuff very seriously. Uh, speaking about, quote, our needs or your needs as opposed to my needs and genders trust helps you come up with solutions that achieve a mutual benefit. Uh, so we all know people that, again, coming back to that previous idea, they only seem concerned about their own interests themselves. You know, the me show starring me. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, we all know people like that, right? Uh, but we also hopefully uh, know people that uh, it's not just about them. And some, sometimes it's almost the, too much the opposite, right? And some, some people are so concerned about other people, they neglect uh, themselves. Uh, so you don't want that either. Um, so just so trying to strike that balance. But I find, uh, just coming back to the belonging example, uh, I really try to make it a point uh, when I'm on campus walking the hallways. If I, if I see you, or a student, maybe I don't know you. I just see a student in the hall sitting there at, at a desk or something. Always, if they, unless they're reading a book or obviously, you know, looking at something, I'll try to say hi, good morning, uh, how are you doing? Not a stop and chat uh, situation, but just a little bit of hi, a little smile, uh, that sort of thing. And I really think that does a lot. Uh, it seems like a really small, trivial, uh, insignificant detail, uh, but I think that. You know, that kind of stuff builds up and uh, makes people feel like, well, OK, <laughs> uh, I feel a little bit more. I feel a little better now about being here. I seem to be welcome uh, in this uh, building in this on this university. And so I think that makes a big difference. You know, contrast that with if I just walked by, I didn't even look around, just you know, made a beeline to the office, didn't say hi. Uh, maybe <laughs> you know me and you were trying to trying to wave or something. I didn't even notice that. I didn't even acknowledge that. Uh, that might make you feel uh, like I'm in my own little world uh, or that maybe there's not much of a community around here. Uh, there's not much teamwork going on. Uh, so again, it doesn't necessarily have to be this big involved ordeal. Just something as simple as saying, hi, how you doing? <laughs> you know, showing some interest in other people can uh, cultivate this sense of community. Now, this is another one of those slides or, or concepts. I think we all kind of know this, uh, but maybe we didn't realize it had been scientifically shown. Uh, but there are, and uh, they're talking about this research where people and your colleagues, your co-workers, uh, could basically be divided up into two groups, givers or takers. And the givers are people that are helpful to you. Uh, again, thinking about myself as a professor, maybe there's a new professor or a new teacher or an adjunct and 
you know, they, they're struggling and they're not sure how to teach 191, let's say. And even though it's not technically my job, I mean, I don't have to, I could just ignore the person. Uh, that would be, <laughs> it's just not me, right? I, I, I want to give stuff to this person. So I might uh, ask, you know, well, I can, you know, give you access to my uh, D2L site. If that would help, you could take a look at what I do, look at my lectures. Uh, I'm happy to uh, give you my notes on textbooks. You know, all of that sort of stuff uh, kind of establishes this uh, a reputation of, hey, you know, Matt's a generous. <laughs> Nobody probably say this uh, out loud, but they're probably thinking, feeling like he's a generous He's generous with his time. He's, he's helpful to his colleagues. And that, you know, looks favorably upon him. It's not like I do it with that goal in mind, right? It's just naturally uh, uh, disposed that way. But I think it makes people look at me a little more favorably uh, than if I was the second category, the, the taker. Uh, so the takers, you know, they're happy to accept the help. <laughs> uh, but then they don't want to give anything back, right? They It's kind of a one-way uh, street with them. Uh, so I've seen this a lot just coming back to basic communication principles. Uh, you know, you might uh, might go by a colleague's office and, you know, hey, how's your day going? And then they, they sort of t take up a lot of your time telling you about all their problems or they tell you about all the research they're doing and they go on and on and on and on, but they don't ever turn the you know, conversation around and like say, okay, that's what I've been up to. What about you? Uh, what have you been doing? And maybe they don't even ask, or if, even if you try to like butt in and sort of insert some of your uh, your activities in there, they suddenly don't. They suddenly have to go, right? Or, oh, look at the time. <laughs> so they, they're they're happy with taking up your time, but they don't want to give you uh, any of their time uh, in that conversation. So uh, again, seems like a small thing, but you know, look how important it is. And again, to tie this back into uh, resumes, uh, which we'll be working on, uh, or be, we'll be talking about them uh, throughout the semester. It's a very common type of business uh, document. Uh, but even there, I always tell students to not just think about uh, what the job can do for them, you know, what, what you can take from this opportunity, what how this job is going to benefit you, uh, but really, you don't even want to mention that. <laughs> that should be minimal. Uh, really, what you want to emphasize is what you can give to the company. You know, what, what's the value that you can bring to them? Uh, what can you give? What can you do for them is a lot more important than uh, what they can do for you. But I swear, time and time, I'm almost without fail, I'll have to go in and make uh, substantial uh, suggestions for revising uh, those cover letters because it's almost always just... You know, I want this job because, <laughs> you know, I need the money. It's not usually that blatant, but, you know, I think this job would be a big benefit, help me develop uh, my skills. And uh, it's almost like this job would be a great stepping stone uh, to better, bigger and brighter things in my future career. I mean, it's, it's almost reads like that, the tone. Uh, and there's very little in there, any, hardly anything specific about what they can give back. Um, they just kind of assume that. So anyway, I don't want to go on for too long about this, but I just really think this is a, an important concept here of, uh, about these givers and takers. So I want to pause here again, you know, and get you to talk a little bit about uh, yourself or people you know that might fit. Uh, you know, are you, could, you feel like you're more of a giver or a little bit more of a taker. Uh, if, you, if you feel like you're a giver, maybe uh, talk about uh, what sort of the ways that you give back to people, uh, give back to your company or your school. Uh, versus the takers, and uh, you know, if you feel like you are a taker, <laughs> what can you do to change? Uh, why might you uh, want to start changing? And I was thinking it might be easier to talk about this uh, in terms of a student at, say, Cloud State. Uh, so, are you, as a student here, are you just taking? You know, you're taking classes, you're taking opportunities as they're presented to you, but you're not giving back, uh, right? As opposed to the giver, uh, would be somebody who's involved in lots of uh, Extra, extracurricular activities, let's say, or you're uh, tutoring, or maybe just informally helping out classmates, uh, offering to help people with their work. You know, which category do you consider yourself to be, and are you happy with that, and what might you do to change? All right, here we have the role of character in establishing uh, credibility, and they define character as uh, your reputation. So a reputation for staying true to commitments 
made to stakeholders and adhering to adhering to high moral and ethical values. That's your character. Now, in uh, ancient rhetoric, classical rhetoric, this concept is called ethos, E T H O S. But this is <laughs> this is good. Uh, so, do you have a reputation, somebody that can be trusted? Um, and then beyond that, are you, are you a good person? Do you, you, know, you, you could be really good at your job again, but if people feel like you're kind of twisted <laughs> or that you're dishonest or you like to lie or you know, maybe you party a little too much, uh, anything, uh, anything of that sort, or you're, you're not, you don't see anything wrong with cheating, uh, th these can all affect your character. And I was really shocked. Something about this book really disturbed me. That was when they were talking about the... Uh, the number of students, the percentage of students who are okay with cheating on uh, college exams. You know, I thought that would be a relatively low percentage. I mean, obviously somebody's going to cheat no matter what. But, you know, apparently that's, I forget exactly what the statistic was. But I want to say like over half or thought it was fine. You know, do whatever you can to get that edge. Uh, and who cares if it's ethical or not? <laughs> this is just terrible. <laughs> it really kind of frightens me. You know what? You know if that's true. Uh, you know I hate to think what the world's going to look like when those uh, when those folks uh, graduate and end up in uh, leadership positions. <laughs> but, for you, uh, but for you, I hope you'll keep coming back to this idea uh, that you know you might want to be honest, forthright, just because it's the right thing to do. Uh, but also thinking about the you know how it casts you and how it could uh, affect your credibility and the real damage that might do to your uh, career once you get this. Uh, tarnished reputation. So uh, adhering to the high moral and ethical values, you know, it's not that you have to be this uh, legal eagle, uh, you know, little angel <laughs> all the time. <laughs> you know, that's not what, I don't think that's what they're getting at there, but uh, you definitely want to avoid the uh, doing things that would bring the, these moral and ethical values in, into question. And so what determines trust and individuals in the workplace. And so we have a nice little uh, bar graph here. You can see honesty is it's kind of a no-brainer, right? <laughs> of course, <laughs> you know, if you feel like somebody's honest with you, uh, that's high. Uh, ethical behavior, uh, you know, is this somebody that, used, that has no problem? Uh, you know, I'll give you a quick, a little silly example of this. Uh, you know, in St. Cloud, you have to pay uh, for garbage bags, uh, special bags, uh, the uh, green bags the city uh, uses, and you know that's how you're supposed to get rid of your trash. Uh, I know some people though that just bring their trash to campus and just dump it in the you know dumpsters there <laughs> on campus, <laughs> and you kind of wonder is that uh, ethical? You know, it's not like it's I don't know if it's illegal or not. I don't, you know, it doesn't seem like it's that. <laughs> it wouldn't make me uh, think the person, well, that person might as well be murdering someone. You know, it's not like that level. Uh, it's just one of those little things, though, and it kind of makes you wonder, well, if they're okay with doing that, uh, I wonder what else they might do that's a little unethical, a little uh, a little bit uh, and a little bit dishonest, right? Uh, so even something that insignificant. And, and, you know, word about that can get around quick. You know, you'd be surprised. Uh, whether somebody is willing to exchange information willingly you know, I have colleagues uh, that say, uh, you know, come to my class. You know, you can sit in my class, see how I teach this. Uh, I'll share my syllabus with you, you know, all that sort of thing. Uh, so all this stuff makes a lot of sense. If we keep going down, you, some of the stuff that uh, is kind of interesting about this graph is the stuff that's towards the bottom, like uh, works for a reputable company. That's only uh, 12%. You know, so people have really gotten away from this idea of brands. Uh, you know, it's kind of hard to think about any company that we consider reputable. But uh, even if you were from, uh, you know, I am from, oh, God, what is a company that uh, has a really good <laughs> reputation? <laughs> kind of struggling here to even think of one. Uh, well, let's say the, uh, what is this little company? I don't know. Let's just say uh, a little local restaurant. <laughs> Uh, House of Pizza, there we go. Uh, so I don't know. That seems to have a pretty good reputation. Uh, what this is saying, though, is that just because you're all working there together doesn't mean people will trust you, uh, your coworkers. 
uh, connectedness, experience, and intelligence are all pretty low. And, and look at uh, uh, communication skills. Yeah, you think this would be a lot higher, but you know maybe that could go both ways. Maybe if you're a really good communicator, uh, that could go into uh, being uh, more of a silver-tongued devil uh, than a you know trustworthy colleague. All right, ethics. Ethics. What are ethics? Ethics are rules of conduct or moral principles that guide individual or group behavior. And usually when there's a problem with a company that, and the company loses their credibility, credibility, it's, it's usually over some ethical issue, right? They've done something that maybe it's not illegal. This is the, the key to this idea. It's, maybe it's legal. It's just not right. So it's, 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 <laughs> I don't want to say evil, <laughs> uh, it's just, they've broken some rule of conduct or even beyond that, just kind of a moral principle. Uh, so this, sometimes you find yourself in these situations, you know, you know where uh, somebody wants you to do something unethical and you probably should not do it because uh, even if the short term effect might be good uh, for you, probably the long term uh, could be very, 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 <laughs> very bad. <laughs> and we don't need to rehearse all the all the incidents. But, uh, how do you cultivate these uh, business ethics? Uh, so in the, in the business, they say the the commonly accepted beliefs and principles in that community uh, for acceptable behavior. And, you know, this is going to vary tremendously from business to business. Uh, you might, I think the, the car lots, the car salespeople, they, they tend to have a bad reputation for being unethical. Uh, I'm sure within that community, they have their own standards. Like what is, uh, you know, maybe Todd over there, he kind of crossed the line somehow. He sold that car, but he kind of lied about something. Maybe that's where they draw the line. Uh, it's not honest, uh, but maybe on the other hand, it would be fine uh, to kind of compliment someone or push somebody towards a more expensive car than uh, you really think they they should uh, be looking at. Maybe they you, you feel like you, you know you kind of looked at the credit reports and you know the person probably can't afford this car, but you're kind of pushing them into it anyway. You know is that is that against their ethics? I don't know. Uh, transparency. Involving sharing all relevant information uh, with the stakeholders. Uh, so this is pretty obvious. You know, you, you want to kind of, <laughs> if you're dealing with stocks and you have investments in a company, uh, you really don't want them hiding things, uh, doing things behind uh, locked doors. Um, you know, and politically, you know, a lot of, there's kind of discussions about uh, some, some of these politicians, you'll see, they'll say, well, you know, we should talk about this privately, <laughs> away from the cameras. Uh, this isn't the right place to be talking about this. And of course, as a voter, I object to that. I'm saying, no, I want you to have the discussion here where the, you know, the cameras are rolling. You know, this is a, more transparency. I sort of see what's see what I voted for uh, versus if everybody goes and, and behind closed doors and I don't know, it's not transparent any, anymore. Maybe there's something unethical uh, going on. Uh, some trust building behaviors, <laughs> extending trust, right? So if you, it takes two to tango, I guess, right? If you don't trust anybody, then why should they trust you? Right? Sometimes you have to kind of take that first step. Uh, sharing information we talked about, uh, telling it straight, All right? And sometimes this can be painful. You know, we don't want to be told we're doing something wrong, wrongly, uh, or that <laughs> you made all kinds of errors or whatever. Uh, but in the long term, you'll remember that, you know, the person didn't lie to you. Uh, they told you uh, what you needed to know. Uh, so ultimately, it will work out. Uh, providing opportunities to people. Uh, admitting when you've made mistakes. You know, this can be a tough one for people. Uh, a lot of people think, well, that would make me look less competent, right? If I keep, if I own, you know, if I admit that I made a mistake, maybe that'll make me look like I'm not good at my job. Uh, well, maybe, but on the other hand, it does... Uh, you know, if you try to cover up that mistake and try or try to blame it on somebody or something else, that will actually make you look worse uh, in the long run. And then, of course, setting the good example by following the rules yourself. You know, there's nothing less effective than that old idea of like, do as I say, not as I do. You know, obviously that's never worked. <laughs> you know, if even you can't follow the rules, uh, why should anybody else uh, take you seriously? All right, so what should you do if you see something unethical going on? Somebody, 
uh, engaged in unethical behavior, whether that's some kind of cheating or stealing or, or dumping. Uh, it could be something illegal, or again, it could be that sort of gray area uh, where maybe it's not technically against the law, uh, but it's just not something a, a good person <laughs> would do. Uh, what can you do, or when should you speak up? And they, they talk about reasons why people remain silent even when there's something uh, nefarious going on, right? Uh, so this is the first, the first one is probably the most common, especially if you're new there. So you just assume that's the way things are done here. Uh, yes, it, it seems a little bit off to you, but maybe you're just new. Uh, you, uh, you know, who knows, maybe you'll uh, evolve your opinion on it. Uh, anyway, you just kind of assume that's the way that it's done everywhere. Uh, that's just the standard practice. Maybe it is, maybe it's just something going on at that particular site, though. You don't know. You haven't been around long enough to know. Uh, you rationalize it. Say, well, it's just not uh, It's not such a big deal. You know, maybe they're, you know, they, instead of uh, taking the leftover oil or paint, uh, the chemicals uh, <laughs> to, to the proper facility, you know, they're just going to go ahead and just dump it there in the, in the lake or the pond or just dump it in the river. <laughs> you know, it's no big deal. It's just, you know, just this, this one bucket uh, you know, something along those lines. Uh, you say, well, it's not my responsibility. You know, I'm just a lowly uh, intern. <laughs> you know, surely there's a manager, a supervisor uh, on up the uh, up the ladder. That's, they're, they're the ones that should be taking care of this, not me. Uh, or probably a good chance of them before. You just want to be loyal. You know, you, you're glad, you're, you're happy that this company's provided you with this opportunity, this job, um, you know, especially if it was really competitive. Uh, the last thing you want to do is just uh, automatically, you know, <laughs> day one, you're uh, getting someone in trouble, maybe even getting someone uh, fired. Uh, but there's some questions that you should ask. Um, and these go with these uh, here. Uh, so if, if, if that's standard, why is there a policy against it anyway? You know, <laughs> or if it's expected, are we comfortable being public about it? You know, so with that person dumping uh, the stuff in the lake, would they be comfortable with, if the, you know, if the news media were there or other people were around, would they do it? Uh, if not, maybe they shouldn't do it. Uh, maybe you are new here, uh, but you might not understand the policy clearly, but shouldn't we <laughs> dot, dot, dot. <laughs> uh, so continue to question it. All right, corporate and personal values. Now, these are kind of self-explanatory. Uh, the corporate values, the stated and lived values of a company. Uh, so Google, for a long time, their motto was do no evil. Apparently that was one of their values. Uh, <laughs> uh, other, you know, you've seen the, the slogans and mottos. Most corporations want to portray themselves as being uh, ecologically responsible, let's say. Uh, privileging uh, diversity, being ethical. Uh, so those are the corporate values. And the personal values are those individual ones. And sometimes these uh, clash uh, with the corporate values, and sometimes they don't. Uh, codes of conduct. So most organizations have a written code of conduct. Uh, so St. Cloud State University has their uh, student handbook uh, where they spell out all these things. You know, what's considered plagiarism, uh, what's acceptable regarding tobacco party <laughs> parties, <laughs> uh, um, what constitutes um, infractions, you know, what can actually get you uh, kicked out of the university, what sort of conduct is completely unacceptable, you know, what are the procedures and, and so on. Uh, so there'll be some kind of code of conduct around there if it's any kind of a sizable company. Yeah. So publicly traded companies are required uh, to have a code of ethics available to all employees and to ensure that it is enacted. So it's not enough just to have the code up somewhere, right? They're actually supposed to, <laughs> they're liable if they're not following it. Uh, so you should certainly figure out what, what that is, what those codes are, and familiarize yourself with them. Uh, aligning personal values with corporate values is an important element of character. And so I was thinking uh, sometimes there's these, uh, the political parties will have, uh, they'll be looking for interns, right? And I don't know if they necessarily specify, <laughs> you know, whether, like, could a, if maybe you're a Republican, but you want to work as an intern for this uh, Democrat uh, Democratic candidates uh, campaign just to get the get the experience right. But even even though your personal values are, might, might be different 
Uh, so how's that going to work out? <laughs> you know, they say you might end up kind of living like this double life, uh, alter ego, where you kind of you're nodding along, you're pretending that you follow the uh, that your personal values and corporate values align, but uh, maybe they don't. And even being willing to put on that kind of facade day after day uh, might begin to have an impact on your character. So it's it's kind of interesting. I mean, I don't know any situation where you're just a hundred percent. <laughs> where you just you just love your company, you love everything they do, uh, your values perfectly align. You know, I don't know if we're, that seems a little bit unrealistic, but uh, hopefully it's not to the point where you feel like you're having to put on a mask or, or some kind of disguise uh, just to work there. All right, so here's a slide about open and honest uh, communication. And it's, it's easy to say, well, a company should always be honest, right? You should just admit when you make a mistake, you should be transparent. Uh, but, you know, in, the, in reality, sometimes you're tempted to avoid it, right? You want to minimize it. Uh, maybe there's been some errors. Uh, maybe you shouldn't uh, confess, you know, because once you do that, you could be held responsible, right? You're, you're acknowledging fault and so on. So you can kind of get, you, you hear people saying things like this, but really, uh, I think this is the, the key. It's better just to, yeah, maybe a short term, maybe it might have some disaster, <laughs> disastrous effects, but uh, nevertheless, trying to be sneaky about it uh, isn't, a, isn't the answer. And that's ultimately going to be worse for you. Uh, dishonesty is among the primary reasons for lower employee morale. Uh, so if, you, if you're going to lay people off, you need to be honest with it. Yeah, they're not going to want to hear it. It's bad news. Uh, but it's even worse to pretend like everything's okay and then just suddenly spring that upon them because then they'll feel like they uh, were betrayed. Uh, dishonesty can be a reason uh, for dismissal. Uh, or you know, There's been people that lied on their resume. Or, uh, you know, there's all kinds of ways people can be dishonest for their own advantage. But, you know, if you get fired for being dishonest or you know, if you plagiarized an essay in college and you got uh, you flunked a class for that, uh, that can be really bad. As some, as some, I think it'd be better just to take the, a bad grade uh, for not doing the work. Uh, at least then you're not being dishonest about it. Uh, turning in the plagiarized essay or downloading one uh, is even worse, right? Uh, so this is a slide about accountability. Another one of those uh, words that gets thrown around a lot. You hear, well, we need to hold this this party accountable. We need to hold this company accountable. <laughs> hold you accountable. <laughs> hold professors accountable. Uh, what do you mean uh, accountable? Uh, well, they say it implies an obligation to meet the needs and wants of others. So an obligation to do that. Uh, that's a sense of accountability. So if you feel like you are accountable, uh, then you need to know what those needs and wants are and show that you're honestly trying to, to reach those goals right? or satisfy those wants and needs. Uh, so thinking about the stakeholder is the key to this slide because uh, this is kind of a big view and there could be lots of different kinds of uh, stakeholders. It might not just be the client. Uh, it could be the other people living in that town, right? Or the people nearby. Uh, it could be a larger group. Um, so it's including all the groups in society affected by your business. That's a good example of this, I think, are these uh, the pipelines you know, that we keep hearing about in the news. And you know, a lot of the, these groups that are upset aren't necessarily in the oil business. <laughs> you know, they're not part or they're not working for the government. Uh, maybe they don't even live in that area, but they still feel like they're a stakeholder. They got a stake in that uh, because of uh, you know, this, this broader view. So beyond just the business uh, part of it, maybe they're concerned about the ecological uh, impact, for example. <clears throat> All right, then finally uh, we get to the fairness in business communications and the fair test. Uh, so what is the fair test to help you do? Uh, how well you have provided the facts. So do you have all the facts on the table? Did you hold some back? How well have you granted access to your motives, reasoning, and information? In other words, can, can we see the work? Can we see how you got there? Now, how well have you examined the impacts on the stakeholders? Have you even considered them? Remember, again, not just the customer or the client at hand, but all the people uh, that have some stake in that decision in your business. And how well have you shown respect? 
So we're going to look at each one of these. Are your communications fair? Uh, the facts. How factual is your communication? Have you presented the information correctly? Have you presented all the relevant facts? Have you been uh, misleading somehow? Have you used the facts in a reasonable manner? <laughs> Will the audience agree with your reasoning? In other words, are you making sort of logical leaps? Um, access. This accessibility, transparency of motives. Uh, so we, do we know, are you being honest about your motive there? Or are you trying to hide something? Have you fully disclosed how you obtain the information? Are you hiding any of the, of the information or real reasons for making certain claims or recommendations, right? Have you given stakeholders the opportunity to provide input in the decision-making process? I think this last one is kind of a, this point might get sort of lost in all these other ones, but you know, it's, it's really key, right? Uh, were you even asked their opinion on it? You know, sometimes that's all people want is just to be able to tell you their opinion on that decision. Um, they might not expect you to uh, necessarily even to do it or take their uh, side, uh, but not letting them say their piece is even is even worse, right? Uh, impacts. How does the communication impact the stakeholders? So have you considered it first and foremost? Uh, do you know how do you know how it will impact them? Have you thought about your communication will help help or hurt others? Uh, how could you learn more about these impacts? In other words, how can you measure these outcomes? And then respect. Have you prepared your communication to recognize the inherent dignity and self-worth of others? So this is a really crucial one. You know, it's always uh, damaging when you hear some leader, CEO, or what have you, if they're saying, if they're using, um, I mean, needless to say, <laughs> obviously, if they're saying something um, blatantly racist or sexist, that's one thing. Uh, but maybe it's not something that's uh, that bl uh, that pronounced. Uh, maybe just the way they're talking, they, they seem like they don't really acknowledge, uh, or they, they're sort of dismissive of, of this group. You know, say, well, that person's part of group part of group X, right? They're they're stupid. <laughs> uh, we don't have to take their opinion seriously. And so they have failed then to recognize the inherent dignity and self-worth of those others. Um, even if the other people aren't in a position to, uh, to communicate. Uh, would those with whom you are communicating consider your communication respectful? So you, it doesn't really matter whether you think it's respectful. Uh, you might say, well, I think I don't have a problem using this term. Um, this is what I was taught to say. <laughs> Or other people, you know, it's a, who cares, right? Uh, the key is the people listening or that you're addressing, do they consider it respectful? Uh, if not, you need to uh, figure out what's wrong and, you know, how to change that. Uh, would a neutral observer consider your communication respectful? So this is another sort of crucial concept because sometimes it could be, um, you know, somebody feels like you've been disrespectful and maybe they feel that way, but really, you know, would a reasonable person agree with them? Uh, so this can kind of go both ways, right? Maybe the, you, you bring in this neutral observer and they might say, yes, that was <laughs> disrespectful. Or they might say, you know, I think the person just misunderstood something or that person's uh, not being genuine or who knows what it is, right? So those are all um, components of this fair. All right, so wrapping up here, uh, high trust relationships, ease of communication, and improved work outcomes. Uh, so if you do have the good credibility, this is going to make everything else easier, more influential. Uh, you know, people trust you, this goes a long way. Uh, credibility leads to less resistance from others, increased willingness to cooperate, reduced likelihood of miscommunication. Right, because if you've given them no reason to doubt you, uh, doubt your honesty, your integrity, uh, then, you know, this is kind of, uh, you know, they're not going to always be questioning uh, and, and looking uh, <laughs> twice at everything you say, trying to find uh, the hidden agenda there. Uh, that won't be there because you haven't done anything to violate their trust. Uh, so this will eat. And here we're talking about engagement. And again, this is one of those words that gets used all the time. You know, we need to have uh, more student engagement or engagement. <laughs> Professors need to be more engaged <laughs> and that sort of thing. What, what does it mean? Or if you're a CEO, you're a manager, you know, do you feel like your employees are engaged or are they disengaged? Uh, what does that mean? And they break it down here for you pretty nicely. So do you, are the employees connected emotionally 
to their work? You know, not just are they happy, uh, but do they have an investment beyond just a paycheck? You know, is there something else there uh, that sort of, um, you know, they have feelings about it? Now, how willing they are to expend extra effort to help their organizations uh, meet their goals? And so when they hear that the company has a goal or the company's not doing well or, or whatever it is, uh, do they feel incentive? Do they have an incentive to, you know, to go above and beyond, uh, or do they not? They just don't care. Uh, that would be disengaged. Now, how much energy do they have to reach those those goals? And so universities uh, like St. Cloud, they're always coming out with, you know, here's the new administration, new president, all these new initiatives, new programs. Uh, here's the goals we want to achieve. Maybe they say we want to have, uh, we want enrollment to go up by 12% next year. Let's just say that's what they say. That's their goal. Well, then it's going to come down to, well, how engaged are the professors and the staff and you know, all the employees there at the university? Uh, do we care about it? You know, do, if you feel like you, if you really love St. Cloud State, love working here, you really like your job, well, you probably will be more, you probably take that more seriously, right? And you'll say, well, okay, uh, what can I do to help out? How can I help the St. Cloud get that 12%? Um, and then the energy level too, right? If you're just kind of like, yeah, how oh, another initiative, <laughs> you know, you probably won't get anything done. And so there's real life uh, economic consequences of this. Yeah, so the study, a study showed the companies with highly engaged employees were nearly three times as profitable as companies with low engagement. You know, so think about that, three times as profitable. And it's just all the stuff we've been talking about in this lecture. Like, do you feel like, are they part of the decision-making process? Uh, do, do they trust the company? <laughs> are they, are, they uh, are you credible as a leader? Or have you been dishonest and putting your own uh, self-interest above their interest? And all that stuff. Okay, so I think that will do it uh, for this lecture. Uh, a couple of the or four takeaways. Uh, so the importance of credibility, I think we've established that. The three components of it, competence, uh, being able to do the job, uh, caring, you know, having some kind of a emotional connection to the people that you're working with and for. Uh, and then your character, your integrity, honesty, sense of ethics. Uh, we talked about what ethics are, corporate values, personal values, how these two can align or sometimes they uh, clash. And then we introduce the FAIR approach. So facts, access, impacts, and respect. And we'll come back to this uh, FAIR approach later. All right, so anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have any comments, questions, uh, <laughs> whatever it is, uh, please feel free to input those, and I'll see you next time.